Hello there, geographers, and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today, we're going to be going into Unit 2, Topic 11. We're going to be talking about forced and voluntary migration. Now, before we get too far into forced migration or voluntary migration, I need to make sure that you know the difference between immigrants and emigrants. Now, in trying to remember these terms, just focus on the action that's happening. If people are coming into an area that I Think of immigrant, they're an immigrant, they're coming into the actual state, the country, the region, the city, whatever it may be. On the other hand, if they're exiting it, E for exit, they're emigrants. So if I'm leaving a country, if I'm leaving my city or my region, then I'm emigrating from that particular geographic location. Now, when people are deciding if they should migrate, sometimes it's on their own merit or sometimes it's because other factors are at play. And this is known as forced and voluntary migration. Let's start with forced migration. This is migration that happens because people fear for their safety or their family's safety or possibly their lives. And this could happen for a variety of reasons. Today, some people are unfortunately forced to migrate due to human trafficking, forced child labor, child soldiers, and other forms of modern day slavery. People flee their homes for the safety of their own families and themselves in search of politically stable regions. Some of those people who are forced to migrate will become asylum seekers. These are refugees who are seeking protection from another country. Refugees are people who had to flee their home due to political persecution, natural disasters, religious persecution, and other threats to their life and safety. Now, if you don't cross an international border, you're considered an IDP, in an internally displaced person. You don't have a refugee status. And if you don't cross that international border, well, it's more seen as a dispute within the country. So the United Nations normally doesn't get involved. To be classified as a refugee, you have to have fleed your country. You have to have crossed an international border. Now we're gonna go into voluntary migration, and there's a bunch of different reasons why people migrate. So we actually have different types types of voluntary migration that occur in the world today. Our first type of voluntary migration is looking at transnational migration. Here people are moving from one country to another. Oftentimes though they're keeping their ties to their original country. They're also going to be moving into an area that has similar cultural backgrounds. People are choosing to emigrate out of their home country and immigrate into the new country based on their own free will. They're not forced to do so. And again, they keep those ties between the two different geographic places. Next we have transhuman migration. And this one's a little bit different. It's connected to agriculture and the seasons. Here we're seeing movement happen with livestock and animals. And the reason why it's occurring is based off the environment. Ranchers will move their cattle up to the highland areas during the summer months and then to the lowland areas during the winter months. So you can see that the migration here is more temporary. It's a cyclical migration. It's moving with the seasons. Now sometimes people decide they want to emigrate from their home city, but they don't want to leave the country or maybe they want to stay in the same region of the country. This is known as intra-regional migration. And other times people want to emigrate and stay in the same country, but they want to live in a different region within that country. This is known as inter-regional migration. Did you catch the difference there? One of those terms was intra and one was inter, and these are really easy to get mixed up. Intra-regional migration is all about people staying within a region inside that country. For example, someone moving from a city to the suburbs of that city. That would be an example of intra-regional migration. On the other hand, if let's say someone wanted to leave the Midwest and move to the Southeast of the United States, that would be moving from one region to another. And that would be an example of inter-regional migration. Now, both those last two types of migration don't have anyone crossing international boundaries. But the next one does. It's chain migration. Here we're seeing actually migration happen as part of family reunification. Oftentimes countries have different immigration policies to try and keep families together. And chain migration is a great example of that. This migration is migration that happens because of people who have previously migrated to a geographic area. Now, the best way to explain it is by an example. Let's say someone's son migrates over to the United States and eventually gains citizenship. They could then apply to be able to get their immediate family to come over. Now, it's not all of their extended, it's just the immediate, their mother, their father, or a spouse. And eventually, after those people have been vetted and have gone through the process, they could then be allowed to enter the United States and possibly gain U.S. citizenship. This chain migration is a great way to keep families united and keep them together. The next type of migration is step migration. And we've talked about this one on the channel before. But when you're thinking of step migration, what I want you to visualize is a staircase. Think of a staircase and you walking up it. On 
on the top of the staircase is your destination. If I'm at the bottom of the staircase, for me to reach the top, I have to walk up the different stairs, the different steps. It's the exact same thing that happens in step migration. I have an end goal in mind, and for me to get there, I have to be able to cross different geographic locations. For example, if I am moving from Minnesota and I want to move to California, I'm probably going to drive because I have to take all my things. And if I'm doing that, I'm probably going to stop at different cities and towns and geographic locations on the way. My migration is staggered. I'm walking up that staircase. Again, my end goal is to get to California, but I'm going to be stopping in maybe Colorado and maybe in Iowa and different places on the way. And this could also stop me from getting to that end goal. I might come into intervening obstacles or opportunities on my way to get to my destination, and that could prevent me from moving on. Now, I mentioned both intervening opportunities and obstacles there, and they're very similar. Intervening opportunities are things that might come up on my travel to my end destination that would entice me actually to stop migrating, to stay there. For example, maybe when I got into Colorado, I got offered this great job opportunity, and I decided then to stay and take it. That would be an opportunity that was presented to me that stopped me from migrating. On the other hand, intervening obstacles are things that would prevent us from going. For example, maybe all of a sudden there was a natural disaster and all the roads got destroyed and I couldn't continue on. Or for example, maybe the Rocky Mountains were just too challenging for my car and it breaks down and I end up getting stuck in Colorado, give up and just turn back to Minnesota. Those would be things that prevented me from going that would be intervening obstacles. Now this next type of migration is a little bit different than the other types of migration we've talked about in this video already. This migration is known as guest workers, and this happens because countries and regions around the world are in need of new ideas and new talent. This migration is temporary. Essentially what happens here is the migrants come into a country, into a society, and they are given temporary legal status. This is tied to their employment or their education. An example of this would actually be when I worked at the Mall of America. I was a floor manager for the theme park. My job was to make sure that the rides opened on time, and if they broke down, we got them fixed and that people had a good time. Now in the summer, we became so busy, we needed to hire more people, but we had a problem. There wasn't enough people applying for our jobs. Because we had such a need for new employees, we actually started a J-term program where people around the world could apply for it and we would actually have workers come and live in Minnesota in the summer from different countries around the world to be able to fulfill our need for more workers. The employees then would get paychecks and many of them actually would send it home to their families or save it to bring it back to their homes. And this is actually another concept. It's known as readmittance. The last type of voluntary migration we're gonna talk about is rural to urban migration. Now, this migration often happens because of economics. It's because people wanna live in areas that actually offer more career paths, have more jobs for them, or have more goods and services for them to use. Rural communities just can't afford some of the amenities that urban areas have. They can't afford the larger hospitals or the more complex education systems even just the variety of goods and services for people to buy and use. So we see that around the world, people are now starting to leave rural areas and move into urban ones. And again, it's because of the opportunities that urban areas offer. Okay, I don't know if this is just me, but we just covered a ton of content and I'm hoping that your head isn't spinning right now. We talked about a lot of stuff. We covered forced migration, voluntary migration, and all the different things that could cause that. Now, make sure that you are understanding this. And the best way to do that is to take the practice quiz that's on the screen right now. Answer the different questions, see if you're getting this, and then check your answers in the comments below. And if you're struggling with human geography and you want a little bit more help to get that A or that five on that exam, consider trying out my ultimate review packet. It's a great resource that covers all the units in this class. All right, that's all the time I have for today, geographers. I'll see you next time when we go into our final topic video for unit two. Until then, I'm Mr. Sin, and I'll see you next time online.